Good, mo <laughs> Good evening, everyone. I'm just going <laughs> to say a few words. I'm Phoebe Bossier, Managing Editor, Editor of the Raven Chronicles, and I just have a couple words of technical etiquette for everyone in case they're not, you haven't used Zoom very often, probably most of you have. Um, our engineer tonight is Tom Stiles, courtesy of Jack Straw Cultural Center. So thanks, Tom, for helping us out tonight. We really appreciate it. For a positive experience for everyone, please mute when everyone's reading. Just mute your, you know, mute yourself and turn off your phone or mute, mute your phone. Uh, if you're using your phone to, you know, zoom in, I guess you can't turn it off, but I, most of you aren't. Um, your videos will be, on, will be on all during this. If you want to turn them off, as you know, you can see everything. We just can't see your picture, but you can see everything going on. Um, if there are any video problems because of bandwidth, that's what usually makes kind of weird Zoom meetings. Some of the bandwidth is too small and then we may ask you to turn off your video or maybe Tom can figure that out. Use the chat function to send us a question to everybody. If you have a private question, just put it to private, the person you're, you want to talk to. Uh, and the reaction, you use that if you have, you know, have a reaction, positive or negative. And I think that's it. I just wanted to make sure everyone knew what to do. And now I introduce to you a good friend and wonderful poet and translator, Carolyn Wright. Thanks, Carol. Hello, hello, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming. Thank you for appearing here in the Zoom room. Um, welcome to Take a Stand, Art Against Hate, uh, the fifth online reading presented by Jack Straw Cultural Center and Raven Chronicles Press. Um, Carol, I'm Carolyn Wright. I'm a member of the Raven Chronicles Press Advisory Board. And this is one of many virtual events that uh, Raven Chronicles, uh, we will be conducting over the next year, as long as this pandemic continues. And this will be with writers and artists that Raven Chronicles has published or collaborated with since 1990, 1991. In fact, uh, a brief history is that uh, Raven Chronicles was established in 1991. Uh, as a Seattle-based literary organization that publishes and promotes artists, artistic work and community events that embody the cultural diversity and multitude of imagination of writers and artists living in the Pacific Northwest and other regions of the United States. And it is certainly uh, an organization, a publisher that is committed to social justice, social change, Envir environmental respect and respect for all people and Black Lives Matter. Uh, we would like to thank many of the sponsors of this beautiful book. Here it is right here. You can see it quite clearly. Very appropriate that the artist who, who did the cover had the woman with a mask over her face. Um, that I was not intentional. Uh, I'd like to hear more of the story of that at some point. But we would like to thank the many sponsors of this and other Raven events this year. And these are Poets and Writers, For Culture of King County, the City of Seattle's Office of Arts and Culture, and the Washington State Arts Commission with NEA, that's a National Endowment for the Arts, funding for project support. And our moderator today, will be Jesse Minkert, who will be introducing everybody who is reading. So take it away, Jesse. Thank you, Carolyn. Uh, thank you, Carolyn, and thanks to Phoebe and, Raven, and the Raven Board for the honor of including my work in this anthology. <laughs> I am further honored and delighted to serve as the moderator for this event, mm -hmm. to keep virtual company with these brilliant and accomplished writers, mm -hmm. and with you, our audience. 
Our first reader will be Catalina Marie Cantu. Mm -hmm. Catalina is a multi-genre, excuse me, Catalina is a multi-genre writer, mm -hmm. interdisciplinary artist, 2017 Jack Straw Fellow, and Voices of Our Nation, Bona alum. Her writing has been published in La Bloga, Metro Poetry on Buses, Seattle Poetry Gr Poetic Grid, Raven Chronicles Magazine, Signs of Life Vachere Magazine, The Inspired Poet Notebook, Pictures of Poets, and the Raven Chronicles Anthology. Mm -hmm. Catalina holds a BA in La Raza Studies and is a JD from the University of Washington. She wow. is a co-founding member and current board president of La Sala Latinx Artists Network. Catalina is currently finishing her braided prose collection wow. and her first YA speculative fiction novel. Please welcome Catalina Marie Cantu. Well, th thank you, Jesse, uh, Bibi Boucher, Raven Chronicles, Anna Balint, and Jack Straw Cultural Center for this opportunity to share my work. Today I'm reading Back Home, which for anyone who has the anthology is on page 93. It was originally published in the 2017 Jack Straw Anthology as it is, and is inspired by Mi Familia, Back Home. Papa always referred to Texas as back home. His familia has loved and lived in the Rio Grande Valley at the southern tip of Texas since long before Texas even became a state. The United States border came to mi familia. Generation after generation, they continue to live back home. Back home, we can get pan dulce, chorizo, tamales, and fresh tortillas just down the street, Papa said. Up north, everything is canned, not fresh. In San Francisco at the VA, Papa and Mama met as clerks with adjacent desks. After their Catalina Island honeymoon, they received pink slips. Papa was a security guard. Mama was pregnant with me. Back home, Tio Gus owned a dry cleaning business, offered Papa a job. We moved in with Abuela, Papa's madre. My primos and I threw lit matches down tarantula holes in her dirt yard, raced radio flyer wagons on bumpy roads, and counted our mosquito bites. Our migration back home was a few years of heat hanging like laundry, mosquito bites totaling in the 90s, Spanish everywhere, and lots of familia adventures. Then we moved up north. Northwest postage stamp town of Chalk people, wherever my family walked, they stopped us. Hey you, where are you going? What are you? Papa, his wavy ebony hair slicked back, elegant sharkskin suit, tie, and shine shoes, met his inquisitors with a stony gaze. We are Americans. Chalk people chorted and shook their pointed heads. Really? Seriously? Where are you people from? We escaped that time. What did I care if no one looked like me? Had a last name that ended in a vowel. Ate Mexican food at home. Must be invisible. Invisible to their world. Shy, skinny, a brown toothpick in a milk sea, bobbing to survive the Moby and the second piece I'm reading is on page 300, again, for everyone who is following along in the anthology. Page 300 is a beautiful piece called Strategies for Outlasting Trumplandia by Gail Tremblay. And I chose this before the election, ironically, <laughs> for Gail's strong indigenous voice and clear prose on survival. Strategies for Outlasting Trumplandia by Gail Tremblay. Lately, each day I wake to a world where the sun seems to rise over the eastern edge of this whirling planet that for millennia has made life possible and I find things in chaos. I watch beautiful beings becoming extinct, forests burning, hurricanes destroying cities and islands, 
water polluted by chemicals, oil, and pesticides, polar ice melting, and coastal land consumed by the sea. All while a man who, like me, is 73 and old enough to know better, makes policies to harm the earth and the circle of things that support life so he and his friends can become richer. By stripping the land of resources we should never use if we are to sustain life for our grandchildren. The older I get, the harder it becomes to understand greed. The lack of grace and insatiable desire to devour that makes life bearable. I long to join with humans who every day thank plants for transforming the carbon dioxide we exhale and the light of the sun into the air we inhale and the food we eat. How living among a million natural miracles can any of us forget the delicate balancing act required to protect the systems that make survival possible. Each one of us needs to remember to give back to earth more than we take needs to whisper into the ear of the mysterious universe and work ceaselessly to transform everyone's consciousness. So we can celebrate together the shift to a new way of living in harmony with this spinning orb we ride for thousands of miles in a great spiral path through the vastness of a space that even in our dreams, we have barely come to know. Thank you very much. Jesse? And the next uh, reader. Thank you, Catalina. <laughs> T. Clear is our next reader. She is one of the founders of Floating Bridge Press and Easy Speak Seattle, which is a reading series. She has been writing and publishing since the late 1970s, and her work has appeared in many magazines and anthologies, including Poetry Northwest, Sheila Na Gig Online, The Rise Up Review, Red Earth Review, Terrain.org, The Moth, and Common Ground Review. She dislikes writing bios as much as she dislikes cleaning her oven. Let us welcome T. Clear. Thank you, uh, Jesse, and thank you, <coughs> Phoebe Bechet and everybody at Raven Chronicles. And I just want to mention that I think Phoebe's Facebook posts help keep me sane during the election season. So important, important detail. <clears throat> um, I love satire's ability to take something we're well familiar with and make us turn around and view it from a different perspective. Janice Butler Holm does just that in Memo to Barbie, Re the Breakup on page 62. Yes, it's humorous, but the voice is menacing and controlling and exhibits how our consumer driven culture requires that a doll must reinvent itself, herself, to be worth her existence. A perfect example of the ageism that many women face. Um, so I'm going to start with Memo to Barbie, Re the Breakup by Janice Butler Holm. One, let us make the announcement. Let us explain that you and Ken will always be good friends. Let us suggest that his replacement is waiting in the wings. Say nothing about the situation to anyone. Two, Prepare for jokes about midlife crises and the perfect plastic couple. How the bridal gown is yellowing in your closet. How Ken doesn't have the equipment. How he's worn more costumes than the village people. How the sex tape must have proved too much. Be ready for crude remarks about Chucky, the Power Rangers, G.I. Joe, and trolls. Smile and say nothing. Three. Prepare for the moral outrage of those who don't like change. She's failed as a role model. 
Separation shouldn't be a publicity stunt. I remember when Barbie meant something. Isn't one Brittany enough? Do not address such comments. Do not defend yourself. Four, get a makeover. Recall that you first won hearts in a swimsuit and tell yourself you could do it again. Think California, think beach bunny. Find the tiniest bikini top possible. Smile sunnily during photo shoots. Five, start selling yourself. Bring in the money now. Remember what, that, what you owe us. We made you. We own you. There are younger ones dying to take your place. Don't tell us you're tired. Get out there and do your job. Think profits. Think performance. Think it's your last chance, bitch. And I would like to read a poem on page 310 um, by me. Uh, I thought these two poems went well together for their commentary on women and men. When the patriarchy crumbles, instructions for men. Look both ways before stepping out of your car in the parking garage. Look both ways when you return. Check that the pepper spray is still in your pocket. Light up the trigger. Clutch your keys like a weapon, the tips extended between the fingers of your fist. Did you remember to lock the car? Check your back seat, lock it now as soon as you get in. Look both ways when you step onto the sidewalk. Look behind you, look over your shoulder. Be wary of shrubs, parked cars, cars that slow down, unlit corners, avoid alleys, listen for footsteps. Walk with a purpose, walk with power. Walk like you're 17 again and can outrun everyone in your class. Even when you're old and haven't run for years, walk like you can. Don't forget any of this. Don't become lax. Don't ever think you're immune. Don't question what you've been taught. Don't think you're the only one that's ever done this because women have done this forever to stay safe, to remain alive. It will become as routine as brushing, brushing your teeth, so automatic you won't even think of the keys jutting from your fist like daggers. Thank you. Thank you, T. Next is Paul Hunter. Paul Hunter is a Seattle poet, teacher, and letterpress publisher who worked on Indiana farms as a boy. His first farming book, Breaking Ground, 2004, Silverfish Review Press, was reviewed in the New York Times and received, Washington, received the Washington State Book Award. Three other volumes, Ripening, 2007, Come the Harvest, 2008, and Stubblefield, 2012, followed from SRP. He was a featured poet on the NewsHour, and the Small Farmer's Journal published his prose work on small-scale farming, One Seed to Another, 2010. His prose poem autobiography, Clownery, appeared in 2017. His Texas cowboy novel is Sit a Tall Horse, 2020. I'd like to note here that I came to Seattle in 1981 with ink still drying on my M.A. as a sculptor. One day, looking for something to do in a town where I knew nobody, I saw something about a poetry reading at the soup and salad restaurant in the Pike Place Market. I went, and the first poet's voice I heard in Seattle was Paul's. Twenty-seven years later, in 2008, Paul published his first collection of prose, Flash Pieces by Me, with a title he suggested, Shortness of Breath and Other Symptoms. And 12 years after that, here we are. Now here's Paul Hunter.
Oh, we're not hearing you. I think maybe you haven't connected your microphone. That would be in your audio settings. Somehow we didn't notice this before. There we go. Can you hear me? We can hear you now. Thank right. you. Sorry about that. Page 136, the tar pit. Consider infantile rage, the tar pit that bubbles up around the age of three or four, spills over each one of us, sticks to everything, may need to be dissolved in gasoline, torched, that for a few never ends, though for a though by second or third grade most will have tiptoed on past. Yet here stands the smoldering child, impetuous, treacherous, fierce, feeling utterly wrong, stomping his little foot, shouting, I didn't want this one, I wanted the red one she got that will not listen to reason, that understands only force, aimed outward at anyone else, where he stands shaking, glowering his sharp daggers, a tiny ruler barking orders at a universe that won't obey his commands, who cannot be deflected, turned back upon himself, since not just the war would be lost, the prince would be, would be burned to a crisp. This is the profound seat of hate lodged in each one of us. This is where enthroned it sits. It cannot be made likable. As with all absolute rulers, it craves only to be fed more of exactly what it knows it likes. Sure, the rest of the world could read its mind instantly if it would just pay attention, fetch on the run what's demanded. Freud called this the id the raging, subconscious, needy appetite, oblivious of others that can never have enough, that every parent does battle with, that at its extreme can only be contained with understated force, saying, because I said so, because I am bigger than you are, and now we're done talking, and you're going straight home to bed. But in the mode of hate, the little one still new to the world might learn if he can make his parent lose her own temper, shout back, he will have won the battle, for now she will be the bully who deserves his resentment, his volcanic hate, which is why parents first need to be grown-ups. Though even grown-ups can be careless, saying, we hate rush hour traffic, hate lima beans, creamed corn, Brussels sprouts, cold coffee, reheated coffee, hate cilantro, hate doing our taxes, which begins to sound like life could be ordered off menus that had mostly been designed to torture our taste buds and keep us waiting forever. So when we are faced with real hate, the misplaced laser-etched hate of the fearful infant overgrown, sulking, disappointed, wronged, who requires someone to blame, someone cowering beneath contempt, who has knowingly wronged him by re reaching for that last donut or job he just spotted, or crossed the street against his arrogant horn, glaring high beams, who needs to be told and shown every time how you changed lanes with your burned out turn signal <laughs> remind you forever and always every time you dare to draw a breath here comes someone who hates you for the light in your eye for your skin's gathering dark for your sex your costume your name that he can't pronounce so why bother hate <laughs> you for all you believe and live by, all you work and hope and dare to dream. 
who will instantly and loudly set you straight about what is wrong with a world with you in it, who will demonstrate his deep naked anger unloved in the wilds of infancy forever lost as if it were his life's purpose, not merely to punish and correct, but to shame, demean, rebuke, humiliate until in the fullness of time the raging infant sputters to a halt as his fury rising up consumes itself. And okay, on a different, it... I, I have another piece, one other short piece on page 103 at the drop in center by Mercedes Lawry. Yeah. Kenny uses two pairs of socks as a pillow, rolls up in a blanket in front of the dryer. Paula's under the free clothes rack, rolled up too in a cocoon of coats and faded sweatshirts. Jack's head is down on his crossed arms, his hands rough hills seamed with dirt. Beside him, his girlfriend eats baked potatoes someone brought in, her eyes flitting left and right. They sleep in the deep well of refuge, even though Stephen squawks nonstop about Yo-Yo Ma and civil engineers, and Lucy tends to her gunshot wound with ragged sighs, and the cold pizza disappears in seconds. They sleep without twitch or jerk because no one's going to hurt them here. And it's warm. The water in the showers never gets truly hot, but the coffee is. Till noon when everybody's, everyone's woken up, eased out, and we wipe the tables with bleach, sweep the floor, and walk to our cars in the cold, pestering rain and drive home. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. For over four decades, Dan Raphael has been active in the Pacific Northwest as poet, performer, editor, and reading host. Moving with Every, his 23rd book, was published by Flowstone Press this June. Many things came out last September from Unlikely Books, and Starting Small will be available in December from Alien Buddha Press. Most Wednesdays, Dan writes and records a political poem for the KBOO Evening News. <laughs> Here is Dan Raphael. Thanks, Jesse. Thanks, uh, thanks Raven. All the the ravenous ones, and particularly all you people in the audience, uh, <laughs> I'm going to read is from Moving with Every. I'll show you the cover. It's from uh, John Strongbow, great S Seattle artist who happened to meet through Phoebe. So <laughs> everything circles around. Uh, the two poems I'm going to read, like, unfortunately, too many poems these days were inspired by the orange one <laughs> leaving us. Um, and this was early in his uh, reign when he, uh, addressing the police academy, told the folks how to treat people they arrested. Whose hand between my head and the door frame? Bang my head against the, hold my fingers to the flame, cry, run, drop and roll, fold into a tree, pray for instant night for the transporter beam to reach me before the bullet. Each day is a little hotter. Night has given up on cooling, wind waiting for motivation, time turning sticky swamp, a glow with memories, analgesic Photoshop. Pizza so complex, no one gets all the same toppings, has the same word for the same flavor. 
She says the cop was tall. He says the cop was average. The meniform, the unifold, anonymous knowledge, the edge of my knowing where the past and future show their tattered pixels, unraveling or not yet hemmed. I go to the bathroom, but nothing comes out. I look in the mirror, but it's the same headlines from three days ago. This threatened, that blocked, the five stupidest things I thought. If I was 20 stories above the ground instead of one, would the actual be any further? Deforested, plated, paved, cheek to jowl, no room to howl. How my clothes close me. Don't cover my head or shave it for full exposure. Put a mask on the back of my skull so you think I'm backing away. Does it matter if the policeman can hear, if he knows my language? So much stops when the cop stops you. The Constitution, common sense, the long crafted reins on my paranoia, on my sense of justice. Is it better to be unlabeled or not to be seen at all? If I don't drive a car, my taillight can't malfunction. My registration can't expire. And the time I spend on the bus is time vulnerable, unfamiliar. Soon police won't pull buses over. They'll reroute them to where none of us want to go. And the other poem I'm reading, I don't know, this question, you know, why did you choose this one? And it's kind of like, because I opened the book and here it was and I couldn't, I didn't need to think of anything else to read because it's so wonderful. Uh, the Wall by Anita and Deneze on page 260. I've got that part. <coughs> Wall of saguaro, butterflies and bones of those who perished in the desert. A wall of worn shoes, dry water bottles, poinsettias. Constructed of gilded or crazy house mirror so some can see their true faces. Build a wall of revolving doors or revolutionary abuelas. Make it as high as the sun, strong as tequila. Boulders of sugar skulls, adobe or ghost. A Lego wall or bubble wrap. A wall of hands holding hands hair braided from one woman to another, one country to another, a wall made of Berlin, a wall made for tunneling, a beautiful wall of taco trucks, a wall of silent stars and migratory songs, this wall of solar panels and holy light, panels of compressed Cheetos, topped not by barbed wire, but sprouting avocado seeds, those Aztec tes testicles, Aztec testicles, say it three times, a wall to keep us in and them out. It will have faces and heartbeats. Dreams will be terrorists. The wall will divide towns, homes, mountains, the sky that airplanes fly through with their potential illegals. Our wallets will be on life support to pay for it. Let it be built of guacamole so we can have a big league block party, mortar it with chocato, chocolate, build it from coyote howls and wild horses drumming across the plains of Texas, from memories of hummingbird warriors and healers, stack it thick as blood, which has mingled for centuries, La Vida, dig the foundations deep. Create a 2,000 mile altar lit with votive candles for those who have crossed over, defending freedom under spangled stars, and drape it with rebozos and sweetgrass. Make it from two way mirrors. The wind will interrogate us. The rivers will judge, for they know how to separate and divide to become a whole. Pink Floyd will inaugurate it. Ex Presidente Fox will give it the middle finger salute. Wild Coyote will run headlong into it and survive long after history forgets us. Bees will find sand scarred holes and fill it with honey. Heroin will cover it in blood, but it will be a beautiful wall, a huge wall. Remember to put a rose-strewn doorway in Nogales where my grandmother crossed over, pistols on her hips. Make it a gallery of graffiti art, a refuge for tumbleweeds, a border of stories we already know by heart. Thank you, Anita.
Thank you, Dan. Next reader is Susan Rich. She is the author of five books, most recently Cloud Pharmacy, shortlisted for the Julie Souk Prize. She is the winner of the Penn USA Award for Poetry and the Times Literary Supplement Award, London. Her poems appear in places such as the Academy of American Poets, New England Review, and Harvard Review. Gallery of Postcards and Maps, New and Selected Poems is due out in 2022 from Salmon Press. Now welcome Susan Rich. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm really, really happy to be in this book that Anne and Phoebe and Thomas worked so hard on. Um, I think during some of the hardest times of the quarantine, I had this book um, faced out on a bookcase so that I could see it every morning when I woke up and it just felt like a, a positive way to start the day. And from there, I'm going to read you Marge Piercy's poem, They Were Praying, which is not a particularly positive poem, but I chose it because it's the first time I found a representation of Judaism that felt true to the way that I grew up and the way I felt. I've just been trying to figure out whether she wrote this for the um, Tree of Life massacre in Pittsburgh, the synagogue where 11 people were shot dead. It seems like she did. This looks like it was a poem that had not been published before it came into this anthology. Um, so here we go. They were praying by Marge Piercy. They were praying. They were shot dead two sentences that don't belong in the same breath. It wasn't anything they said. It wasn't anything they did. It was their identity he was killing. We're so easy to hate, like slugs, like taxes. We're considered white now, but not by all. I remember when we weren't. Dirty Jew, dirty Jew, all through my childhood. Aunt Kate's father, sister-in-law, he was trying to Jew me down. Irish Catholic kids chased me on what they called Good Friday, forced to sing Easter hymns, Christmas carols in school. Mother curled over her Judaism like a wound she must keep secret. These years we tend to be out, even proud. Now that could kill me. Little Hitlers abound. It's back. I'm glad I'm old. So from there, I will read my poem that's in the anthology. It's called For the First Time I'm Afraid. And it might be helpful to know just a tiny bit of background. And that is I teach at Highline College and once a year, sometimes twice, we have nationally famous poets come to the college and give workshops for students and teach and, I, and read. And I get the joyous job of being their chauffeur for the day. And so I've, I've gotten to spend a lot of um, traffic stops with some famous poets. And I'll just say this was one of those poets. The poem's called, For the First Time I Am Afraid of My Country, I Say. And he says, yes. He who has not taken his safety for granted does not shame me for only understanding this now. We navigate the broken interstate eyes focused on our near future and the shape of the talk continues on civil in slow drawn twists and turns past green exit signs and a floating bridge that disappears across the lake behind the cut two complete strangers portrayed in black and in white, 
driving our nation's highway in the rush hour of late spring. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Carolyn Wright's most recent books are the dream, excuse me, This Dream the World, New and Selected Poems, Lost Horse Press, 2017, whose title poem received a Pushcart Prize and was included in the Best American Poetry 2009 and the award-winning bilingual volume of Chilean poet Eugenia Toledo, Trazas de Mapa, Trazas de Sangre, Map Traces, Blood Traces, May Apple Press, 2017. Wright co-edited the groundbreaking anthology Raising Lily Ledbetter, Women Poets Occupy the Workspace, Lost Horse, 2015. A Hugo House teacher and contributing editor for the Pushcart Prizes, Wright has received awards from the NEA, For Culture, the Fulbright Program, and the Sakatar Foundation. Welcome once again, Carolyn Wright. Thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate being here. Thank you to Phoebe and Anna and everybody who has uh, contributed to this anthology and worked on producing it, putting it together, and just choosing the work and the beautiful uh, illustrations and artwork within it. Uh, I'm going to start with my poem in the anthology, which is called Ghazal for Emily Parker. Now, a Ghazal is a special form. Oh, and it's on page uh, three, oh, excuse me, 214. A guzzle is a, is a special form that originated in the Middle East and South Asia, and you'll hear there's repetition in it. Uh, and in this case, the repetition is the word Portuguese. And why Portuguese? Well, you'll see um, the sad story of this little girl named Emily Parker, who was one of the 20 children killed in the Sandy Hook uh, grade school massacre in Newtown, Connecticut on December 14th, 2012. And the poem emerged from her father, uh, Dr. Parker, who was uh, speaking a day or two later with the media about, about his daughter and talking about the last time they spoke that morning, the morning she was killed. And this is what he said, guzzle for Emily Parker. He had been teaching her to speak Portuguese. So their last words together were in Portuguese. Such simple words that morning. Thank you, please. I love you, daddy, all in Portuguese. Then he rode off to work past winter trees and she to school smiling to herself in Portuguese. She fell with her classmates, the other girls and boys, folding into herself like snow. No tongue, no Portuguese, no hearts that walk outside their lives in fields that winter can't amend. No Portuguese can call them back, unspeak their parents' grief in English, Spanish, Chinese, Hebrew, Portuguese. Oh, Charlotte, Daniel, Olivia, Anna, Josephine, Dylan, Madeline, Catherine, Chase, Jesse, James, Emily, Jack, Noah, Caroline, Jessica, Benjamin, Aviel, Allison, Grace. And those names recited at the end are the names of the 20 children as President Obama recited them at the memorial service a few days later. 
and the second poem I am going to read, the second piece I'm going to read uh, is uh, very different in tone. It is by Tiffany Midge. It is called Attack of the 50-Foot Lakota Woman, and it is on page 270 for those of you who have the anthology. The reason I chose it was I like Tiffany Midge's tone and she is uh, quite, she can be quite, you know, powerful. So, Attack of the 50-Foot Lakota Woman by Tiffany Midge. In September 2016, a 50-foot monument bearing the likeness of an unnamed Lakota woman, replete with a blowing in the wind star blanket shawl, was installed upon the banks of the Missouri River in Chamberlain, South Dakota. Her creator titled the giantist, giantist sculpture Dignity. At the time of Dignity's launch, if you followed the Missouri River to the north, another launch took place. Concussion grenades, water cannons, rubber bullets, dog attacks. A launch of incalculable greed and disregard for life. The No DAPL Dakota Access Pipeline protests, demonstration, and standoff was an event on a scale which the world has never seen, and it sparked universal awareness and attention towards the most critically urgent issue of our time. Protecting the water. Mini Wikoni, water is life. The Dakota Access Pipeline Project is expected to cover 1,172 miles and to connect the Bakken and Three Forks production areas in North Dakota to Potoka, Illinois. The pipeline will enable domestically produced light sweet, sweet crude oil to reach major refining markets. The pipeline cuts straight through ancestral lands sacred to the Standing Rock Nation and threatens their main water supply, the Missouri River, Manisosi. LaDonna Brave Bull Allard, Standing Rock Sioux Tribal Preservation Officer, owns the northernmost land of the Standing Rock Reservation. The northern border is the Cannonball River. The eastern border is the Missouri River. From her land, you can see the pipeline corridor. The land she grew up on tells the story of this river back 2,000 years. When I think of the dignity sculpture and the militarization and standoffs in the small, otherwise peaceful communities on Standing Rock, where my own mother and grandparents were born, and specifically, when I think of monsters in regards of the black snake prophecy, I can't help but think of the 1958 creature feature, Attack of the 50-Foot Woman. In the movie, a rich socialite encounters an alien life form and is transformed into a giantess, a 50-foot she-beast. The King Kong-sized woman goes on a rampage after discovering her husband in a bar with a no-good floozy. Eight industrial-sized hooks, four lengths of chain, 40 gallons of plasma, an elephant syringe, and electrical fire later, she is finally subdued. The authorities responsible for successfully capturing and bringing her down holler things like, I can't shoot a lady. What do you want me to do, salt her tail? In my reveries, the dignity sculpture breaks from her foundation, secures the blue star quilt firmly around her shoulders, and follows the Missouri River north to Cannonball, up to the Oseti Sakawan, seven council fires, straight into the heart of things, and gets to work killing the black snake. In my reveries, the authorities do not succeed in bringing her down. Eight industrial-sized hooks, four lengths of chain, 40 gallons of plasma, an elephant syringe, and electrical fire. 
In my daydreams, she is not defeated, but victorious and freeze-framed eternally. Despite concussion grenades and dog attacks, water cannons and rubber bullets. The land she grew up on tells the history of this river back 2,000 years. What stories of this river will be told in 2,000 more? Thank you. Thank you, Tiffany Midge. And now uh, I am going to in introduce, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce our final reader and moderator, Jesse Minkert. Jesse has been the executive director of arts and visually impaired audiences. Jesse and Avia, or AVIA, with the Jack Straw Cultural Center, have worked with blind school aged children on audio arts, the Blind Youth Audio Project, annually since 1996. This year it happened for the first time online. Jesse's poems and stories have appeared in about 70 journals, including Confrontation, Floating Bridge Review, Poetry Northwest, and Harper Palette. In 2008, Wordworks, Woodworks Press published his collection of flash fiction, Shortness of Breath, and Other Symptoms. In 2017, Finishing Line Press released his poetry chapbook, Rookland. So take it away, Jesse. Thank you, Caroline. And many, th oh, okay. Excuse me a minute, I have to switch files. Mm -hmm. Okay. My contribution to Take a Stand, Art Against Hate is on page 59. It is called Grounds for an Investigation. Beans grow in the grounds, roast like children in the sun. Beans, dark and dry, come home, come home to my grinder. Soak in heat and hope like children on the border. Truth, like coffee, seeps out brown and bitter. Lies, like sugar, will be added later. And now I'd like to read a piece by someone with actual authority on this subject. On page 176, Claudia Castro Luna, Washington State Poet Laureate, February 1st, 2018 to January 31st, 2020. Her title is, I See Myself and Courage and Hope in the Faces of the Caravan, November, 5th, November 9th, 2018. When I consider the rhetoric deployed to describe the groups of mostly Honduran men, women, and children making their way through Mexico up to the U.S. border to ask for asylum, I am filled with profound sadness. Words such as invaders, violent, and vicious counter what I see in the faces of mothers carrying babies in their arms, in toddlers collapsing from exhaustion, in the stance of women walking all those miles in flip-flops, in men whose eyes betray desperation and anxiety. Perhaps I see vulnerability and despair where others see aggression and cunning because I came from one of the countries these asylum seekers are fleeing. I fled El Salvador as a youth in 1981 with my parents and sister 
weeks before the Civil War was officially declared, having experienced terror from not knowing whether you will be killed at any moment from the violence around you, and knowing what it is like to have a loved one targeted for murder, I can attest that a person who leaves everything they love and value behind to embark on an uncertain and perilous journey is up against indomitable circumstances. We left with a little more than what these people are carrying, which is to say, nothing. We had at least a small suitcase each. My sister carried a stuffed animal, and I, a doll. In that sense, we were no different from the thousands upon thousands of Italians, Germans, and Irish immigrants who huddled in ships made the penurious and dangerous trip over an ocean in search for a better life, with hope folded carefully, neatly, into the breast pocket of their tattered clothing. Hope, one of those simple four-letter words that pack a punch is completely absent from the vocabulary used to describe the individuals walking hundreds of miles to reach the U.S.-Mexico border who continue their march day after day knowing full well that they are not wanted here, knowing that a campaign is being waged to discredit whatever claims of asylum they might have. They do this because hope, the ardent song that guided every European emigrant that made it to these shores going back to when this territory was not yet the United States of America also beats in their hearts. Today, as a middle-class citizen, I can also attest that in the safety and comfort of our homes, it is hard to imagine such fear and hardship it is hard to imagine what it might be like to have nothing else left but courage and hope. It is easy to cast unkind, malicious labels that erase people's individual dignity as humans. I see the photographs. I read newspapers. I am on Twitter. And what comes back to me again and again is the golden rule. I see myself in the faces of the folks on the caravan, a terrified 14-year-old holding on to my mother's arm. I am no different from them, and by extension, I know that among them are future professors and doctors, like my Honduran friends, who arrived in the U.S. at roughly the same age I did. Among them are nurses and small business owners, like my cousins and poets, and writers like myself. Words bear different weights. When my family arrived in the U.S., the Evening Times, a Florida newspaper, wrote a story with the headline, America offers one family a chance to forget fears. Our story was framed as America offering us something, a chance. Like thousands from the old continent, we took it gratefully and squandered not a crumb. I say the tired, poor, and wretched making their way through Mexico up to our southern border would do the same. What if we framed these people's experience with words such as courage and hope? I believe we would restore a me measure of dignity to their very human response to an untenable situation. In so doing, we would also hear the fervor radiating from those very words flowing within ourselves. Thank you very much. Now I have to shift files again. <laughs> Thanks, Jesse. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carolyn. Yeah. Thank and many you. thanks to all of the readers tonight. Yeah.
yeah, this, this concludes great. tonight's group readings. <laughs> From here, we will do our best to answer questions. You have if anybody posted in has the chat any window. questions, yeah. Carolyn has prepared a list. She will serve as moderator for the Q&A. Thanks very much for joining us. I'm glad we're all here. Yeah, me too. It's wonderful to be with everybody. Yeah. Uh, I haven't I haven't posted any questions in the chat yet, but uh, I can start with a question that uh, I think it would be great if if uh, we could wonder somebody oh somebody has a question I'll start with that question Alan Braden is asking what's next for Raven Chronicles Press yes. Well, I guess I can answer that. Yeah. <laughs> um, I would like to hear from Anna too about what, you know, uh, since she was, she and I are the principal person, people that put this uh, anthology together. <clears throat> uh, we, right now we're working on, uh, Kat, we're republishing Kathleen Ocklow's, the very first in this trilogy, Spirits of the Ordinary, which has been, it's been like 20 years when it came out and it got, you know, tremendous reception, but we're public, republishing it with a new forward, and uh, we just finished doing the ebook of it, and we've never done an ebook before. So, and that's coming out in May of next year. Mm -hmm. uh, but we're also just starting. Um, and is Anna Linzer still there? She might have left, but she is one of the editors of the second anthology. Uh, not, not the anthology about <laughs> our first anthology. To get, we put together work from 1991 to 1996. Mm -hmm. And the next 10 years, we're working on that. And that's going to be our second kind of, but it's not going to be 500 pages. That was <laughs> <just> ridiculous. <laughs> but so we're going to do like three, three, maybe a four, just an anthology kind of, of selected pieces from all the magazines we published over the years, which, you know, we're happy to do. There's so many, much good work. And I have, folder back here of <laughs> these are all the magazines we published back mm -hmm. right here so that's what we're working on right now <laughs> anna do you have anything to say which anna you you <laughs> you with that beautiful black cat <laughs> yeah um i don't really have anything to say about the plans you're talking about because i'm not directly involved in those right now but I, I mean, we have talked about going forward, Raven's sort of long-term vision is not only to do anthologies, right. um, but also to publish, you know, different genres, um, work that in one way or another sort of fits with um, our mission statement, which <laughs> is there on the website. I don't know if you've got that handy. Mm -hmm. Is it good no. to read that? God, I don't have it right here. <laughs> I I read a sort of a version of it from the um, from the acknowledgments page uh, or the uh, the copyright page when I first started about how how Raven was established and what its mission is. This is our our new mission. Um, kind of we put together just recently. <laughs> um, we strive to pu publish and showcase work that embodies the cultural diversity of writers and artists, work that expresses family and forebears, mm -hmm. work that connects with the soil, water, and air of place and home. To this end, Raven Chronicles will publish the work of traditional storytellers along with experimental work in emerging forms of art and literature. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a short <laughs> mission there. Yeah, so I mean, but that's that's still got to really start going out more broadly right, into the right. world. And what it will bring back to Raven, we have to wait and see. Yeah. yeah. Um I had a I had a sort of a question, um, given the fact that this anthology, Take a Stand, Art Against Hate was put together in response to uh, the 
four terrible years of this regime that has been ongoing and we hope is really going to come to an end in January. Um, what will be, uh, how will Raven's vision shift to accommodate and enfold the new administration and all of the work that we all must do in order to heal from what we've all been going through. And of course the anthology was a way of resisting in, in a positive and uh, active and urgent way. And now, how is that, how is that energy going to evolve? Well, I'd, I'd like to speak to that a little bit because it's true that Trump or the orange man, was, <laughs> that, that was the impetus for the anthology. But I don't think it's um, accurate to look at the anthology as sort of like, okay, it was a response to Trump. Mm -hmm. That's hopefully behind us. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, everything right. else is sort of changed and we're in new territory. Because right. as, as the anthology itself really makes clear, it's rooted in the history of white supremacy that this country founded on. Mm -hmm. And a lot of other things that predate predate Trump mm -hmm. and will continue on regardless of you know who's in the White House at this point. Yeah. And so you know much of where we're going going forward, I mean this the, the, the past four years have also seen unprecedented grassroots movements on many, many fronts, you know. And so sort of continuing to root ourselves in those yeah. and um you know bring those voices forward in different ways will will i mean i don't think it's suddenly going to change dramatically right. if um we have a different president mm -hmm. yeah i certainly agree with that i do have more hope if there if it ever comes to fruition that he's going to be kicked out but we'll see yeah I mean, yeah. one thing that's very immediate coming up is is the reading that we got planned for the day after inauguration. You know, and we've chosen that date specifically as an opportunity to take you know the power and the voices of this anthology, its vision, and and take a stand on that particular day. You yeah. know, yeah. Um, so. Uh, hopefully yeah. you guys will let everybody know and we'll have a big turnout for that. Yeah, Anna's going to moderate and we have Chip Livingston, who's a great mm -hmm. Native American poet. Tiffany Midge will be reading. Oh, Jay great. Carr will be reading. Uh, Henry Seven Renault from California, mm -hmm. who's an interesting African American poet. Uh, yeah. Pania Abba, I can't pronounce her last name. A Samoan poet will be reading. And uh, one other. Um, Carletta. Car oh, no, oh, Carletta's not Carletta. reading. Yes. No, she can't read. Oh. Carletta's reading on the 7th. Mm -hmm. Ah. We're talking about the inauguration. Okay. I, I, your text yeah. confused me earlier. <laughs> yeah, Carletta uh, can read on the, she can't read because she's going to uh, be working at the library. And this reading on mm -hmm. the day after the inauguration, January 21st, <laughs> um, she's still working for the library. And it, this reading is going to be hosted by the Seattle Public Library and Seattle City of Literature. Mm -hmm. So that's why Carletta can't read because she'll be working for the library and there's a conflict. So, yeah. Yeah. so we, will, we will be getting one more reader, but we haven't really decided at this point. And uh, it, I think of this anthology, as I said somewhere, it's a, it's a print form peace march. I and love I that. think that this will, this peace march must continue throughout uh, the last days of the current regime and into the new administration where we will be needing to give as much support to new leaders and to each other. Yeah. As as we go forward into 2021 and beyond. Yeah. 
Yeah. I do have hope and I'm not an optimist, but we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> um, we had a question about uh, uh, any themes re related to um, climate change or COVID-19. And then we had a wonderful comment here that the Orange Menace has inspired artists. So I have to say that even though we've, we've been faced with a lot of challenges, um, fatal ones, including you know, this pandemic and all of the other neglect and corruption that has made life very difficult for many people around the world, as well as in this country. Um, I'm hopeful that, uh, I'm, I'm pleased that the human spirit, the, the spirit of artists has been so resilient and that we have continued to write and to resist and to make art and to make good trouble, as <clears throat> the late John Lewis said. Yeah. And yeah. Um, so let us continue. Oh no, Susan's got another beautiful cat. <laughs> <laughs> oh, beauty, that's a beauty. You think we, uh, you think we ought to open, uh, wake up Liz Johnson? <laughs> Is she still sleeping? Yeah. That's my uh, sister. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that's my sister. I just saw her. That's your sister? You can't. Yes. Oh, I see what you mean, yeah. I know. Let me look. You see that? She will never live this down. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could sleep that well. I do have a question for Phil, since your, your audio's on. Uh, what's happening with the uh, canoe journeys? Anything? Is it just completely shut down right now? Uh, they have already uh, postponed the journey for 2021. Oh, okay. To, to Slaman. Oh. And uh, uh, I talked to Connie McLeod from Puyallup, and she said that she was thinking of, of, of having a short journey down here where they will open up the the tribal grounds and, and welcome mm. people to come in there. Mm. But we don't know all of what's going to happen yet. And I'm thinking that we'll probably get our shots, COVID shots by April or May. So, but it might not be time enough to uh, right. revive the, the journey. Yeah, yeah. Bill's been working Better on safe than sorry. Yeah. Does anybody have any questions or comments? Uh, are, pe are people able to unmute themselves or do we need to be able to? No, they unmute can unmute them? themselves. Okay. Everybody can unmute Well, I'm, I'm reading tomorrow night. You are? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Where? Uh, I'm uh, on, co on, <laughs> on Zoom. For yeah. the South Sound group, uh, huh. uh, uh, Sandy was on line here. Uh -huh. Maybe she wants She's to announce it. There she is. Yeah, Sandy, Sandy, speak up. Sandy, Sandy, unmute oh, yourself. Oh yeah, hello, yeah. hello, hello, hello. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sending you the link. Okay. Okay. Great. No worries. Oh uh, yeah, tomorrow night mm -hmm. is the Poetry Network. Oh and we're hosting reading and uh our featured reader is the esteemed philip red eagle <laughs> send me the link. Reader. so i'll send you the link uh, actually i can now um uh i've got it right here i'll put it in the chat and okay, uh good. we yeah, great. it opens at 5 30 uh if you want to sign up for the open mic open mic starts at six and uh phil will be on at around seven so everyone's all welcome. On facebook. It's all on it's, facebook. yeah it's, it's, zoom. it's on zoom and it's on we have opn has a facebook and mm -hmm. go, you can go to olympia poetry now right the link is um is it's a pro you know it's a private 
it's a private link, so yeah. I'm okay. going to put it in. It can't be publicly right. shared, right. shared because of security, but I will put the link in here because um, I know that this is um, a secure space, and yeah. we're so, so thrilled to be able to to have to have to, to you know to have Phil Reed and um, I'm looking forward. I'm the host tomorrow night. We rotate yeah, oh, great. hosts, so I'm okay. looking forward to that. And I'll put that in the chat. That's great. Uh, and I had a question for Phil, you'll be getting an email from me oh. later. <laughs> I have a question for T. Claire. T. Uh, there's so many T. There's so many. <laughs> Zoom stuff going on. It's like every day, so it's really. Yeah, hard. Yeah. Are you doing speaky uh, speak easy? Easy speak. Yeah. I mean easy yeah. speak. Second I, and fourth Mondays. Two two, two yeah. times a month. Two times a month. Oh really? Okay. Still via and via Zoom. That's great. Yeah, we're on we're on Zoom. Okay. Yeah. There's no getting away from Zoom these days. <laughs> are you are you usually the host? No, Peter Monroe is the host. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. he is still. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It's yeah. a good group. We have, um, we're not having a featured reader next, next one. Actually, we're, I don't think we're having a feature until the first of the, uh, until January. Mm -hmm. But we have anywhere between 20 and 25 um, open mic people. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it goes, sometimes goes on a little long, longer <laughs> than I would prefer. But, um, Anyway, the um, information is on the Easy Speak website. Um, okay, yeah. Speak Seattle. You can get okay. the link. Thank you. You bet. The website. Oh, Liz is awake. <laughs> oh, no. Oh. <laughs> Jesse? Where's Jesse? Hey, Jesse, your sister's awake. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back, Liz. Better. Well, should we call it a night, Jesse? That's uh, okay with me. <laughs> yeah, this was this was wonderful. Thanks to everybody who attended, and thanks to all of the readers. And yeah. it was a it was a, a wonderful event. We had a we had a lively group here, and. Uh, interesting good work and good selection good selection yes. of work yes yeah may we may we continue may the uh may the march continue <laughs> across across the days and weeks and months across this uh duwamish land upon which those of us who are in seattle have made our homes and for those of you out beyond this reach of seattle um May everybody have a good night and stay warm and dry in spite of the rain out there. <laughs> yeah. Bye, everybody. Bye bye. Thanks so much. Thanks for having us. And, and uh, yes, courage, strength, and art against hate, right?